Welcome. For those of you online, welcome. Thank you for being a part of our service today. We're so glad that you are here. Well, today is going to be the last message in this series called Masks. And we've talked about different masks how that we will wear, uh, how that we will wear a, a mask of, of um, shame and guilt and, and all these things. And so what we're learning is how to take these masks off and to be real. Today, I want to talk to you about, uh, in this last message, the mask of financial insecurity, financial insecurity insecurity. What we're going to do today, we're going to read a passage of scripture that I think is going to be incredibly helpful for us to understand the grace and the mercy and the love of God. And uh, it has a main message, a main meaning. Let, let, let me just say this. When it comes to um, there's always a meaning. I believe that the Bible is inspired by God. It is inerrant and that God gives us a message. And there is a uh, a message in the scripture that is always true. But there are many, many applications. Okay, for example, when we say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, we believe that God is in control, that Jesus is the good shepherd. And that's the meaning of that. But there are many applications that will help us deal with our greed or our lack or provision. So there's a lot of applications. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read to you a passage of Scripture that maybe you've heard of that I think will give us uh, a meaning. I'm going to give you the meaning of it, and then I'm going to make an application that I think will be very helpful to us. So we'll get, begin reading in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. We're going to read 18 verses, so follow along with us. And after these things, God tested Abraham. Let me pause there. If you don't know the Bible, Reason that, um, and I don't know if I've got my map here or not. That I can hold, all right? Thank you. I apologize about that. But uh, in uh, the is is... Um, uh, he is a recipient of the promise. How is it that the singers don't have any problems? And I, but I do. You don't have a single problem until I get up here to speak. I'm starting to feel a little bit some way about that, all right? All right. Well, the story behind Abraham is God had promised him that he would have a son. Now, God gave him this promise when he was 90 years old. It was not until he was 100 years old that God fulfilled the promise. Not only that, but his mother, Abraham's wife, Sarah, was 90 years old. How many have a great-grandmother? Great-grandma? Anybody have a grandmother or great-grandmother that lived in their 90s? I had all four of my great-grandmothers lived into their 90s. I'll never forget, I went to my grandma Wagner's uh, one time. She was in her 90s. And we noticed that in her house, of Tom Selleck. She was in her 90s. A life-size poster of Tom They don't know who uh, Tom Selleck was. He was a, a very sexy man, all right, back in, the, uh, back in the day. And I looked at my grandma. Poster of Tom Selleck on the back of your door. She said, well, son, I'm old, but I ain't dead. Now, what are we, what, what are we talking about here? Sarah was 90 years old. I don't know if you have a great-grandma that lived that long or a grandma that lived that long, but let me just it ain't normal. Pregnant, all right? Are, are we all in agreement with that? It was a miracle of God, and God had promised to them that they were going to have a son, and he answered them. Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90, 
and he said that through your seed, that your offspring are going to be like the, the stars in heaven. In other words, a lot of them. And he said, through your seed, there will be uh, that all the earth, he's talking about Jesus Christ, of course, that he would be our Savior. So, let's, that's a little background. Let's finish reading. And after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Now, let me just pause here and say this. God does not condone human sacrifice, all right? If you are a skeptic or maybe you're just not that familiar with the Bible and you read this, you're like, what? Abraham to sacrifice his son. God was testing Abraham with what was most precious to him. And by the way, he'll test you as well. The things that are most precious to you, he'll test you with. But we know that God is not uh, requiring human sacrifice here because God prohibits human sacrifice in several passages of Scripture. Deuteronomy 18.10, Leviticus 18.21, and uh, Leviticus 20 uh, verses 2 to 5, and at least 15. Scripture, we find that God prohibits human sacrifice. So it's not a question of if God was actually going to make him, um, you know, sacrifice his son. God was testing him. But what we know is that God. Uh, of Jesus Christ. So this is a picture of the gospel. This is a picture of Jesus dying for our sins. And of course, God has perfect knowledge and he knew what the outcome would be anyway. So let's pick up. He said, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. God had told him, and on the third day, his eyes and saw the place from afar. And then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you. And what is that picture? That picture is Abraham's faith. As far as he knew, God was going to ask him to sacrifice his son. But he said, boy and I are going to go over there and we're coming back. Now, that shows me the faith that Abraham had, that even if his son had died, that he would be resurrected back to life again, all right? So, he had great faith. And so, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and and he took his hand and the fire and the knife. So, they went, both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Once again, this is a picture, a foreshadowing that God would provide for us a son, a sacrifice, his only son, Jesus Christ. This is a picture of the gospel, and it foreshadowed the obedience of Jesus to the will of God. Do you remember when Jesus, before he was crucified, what he did? He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? And he prayed, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. You see, Isaac was a picture of the obedience of Jesus to the will of the Father. And when they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Abraham, so, but the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. By the way, God already knew that. So why would he do this? He did it for Abraham's benefit. And often the tests and the trials that we go through, they're not for God's benefit. 
God knows you. He knows your faith. It's for your benefit. It's so that you will discover that, yes, you have strength, that you can last in the middle of a storm, in the middle of a trial. So God knows. And um, he said, uh, and Abraham lift up, lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. In the Hebrew language, this is Jehovah or Yahweh Jireh. It means that the Lord will provide. One of the prayers I pray every week is that Jehovah Jireh will provide for me, for this church, for you. Now, I'm not just talking about financially, but God provides in every way for us. He is our provider. And it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Let me just give you a little clue about that. Anytime you see in the Bible where it talks about the mount of the Lord, or it talks about the city of God, or it talks about uh, the place of the holy city, or it talks about something of that nature, what it's talking about, because in Jerusalem, in, uh, on, in the Old Testament, where uh, I, Isaac was taken to be sacrificed, where Abraham took his son Isaac, was the same place, scholars tell us, that Jesus Christ died for our sins. On the mount of the Lord, the city of God, that holy city. So whenever you see the Bible talking about that, it is pointing to the fact that Jesus died for our sins. And he died on Mount Calvary. And he died on a place of a skull called Golgotha. And because he died there, he paid for our sins. But thank God he didn't stay in the grave. He got up out of the grave after three days. So anytime you see the Bible talking about that in that place, it's not that, that there's anything magical about that place. Kim and I were supposed to be going to the Holy Land just a few weeks ago. And of course, the Israel uh, war uh, broke out and our trip had to be canceled. But we're going to go back again one day. And look, just because you go there to the Holy Land, I understand that's a wonderful place. I've never been there. It'll really help you appreciate Scripture. But there's nothing magical about that place. Don't you understand? What the Bible is talking about in that place, the Mount of the Lord, the city of God, that holy, Mount Zion, that holy place. What's it talking about? It's talking about where you meet God with the gospel, where you meet God in his grace. It is there that the Lord will provide. And so what does it say? That when you come into right relationship with God, when you meet Jesus Christ, when you give your life to him, it is there that the Lord will provide. What does he provide? He provides forgiveness. He provides salvation. He provides redemption. He provides justification. He provides for us. But not only that, he provides for us in other ways as well. He provides for us financially. He provides for us in every part. Just like it said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God makes a way in the wilderness. God makes a way for us. He said that in the presence of my enemies, you're going to feed me and my cup is going to overflow. So what is he saying? It is there that the Lord provides. Can I just say this? Some of you may be watching online and you need to hear this. Maybe the reason, maybe the reason that God isn't really blessing you like he was and, and, and blessing, we're not just talking about money. You might be making a lot of money. But the Bible talks about in the book of Psalms that he gave them what they wanted, but he sent leanness in their soul. You ever notice that sometimes you can have money, but still be empty? Sometimes you can have what you think you want, and it's not what you want at all. And, and, and there is a reason that we feel 
separated from God. There's a reason that we feel cold spiritually sometimes. Sometimes it's because we're not meeting him there where the Lord provides. That's why church is so important. Oh, does church make you go to heaven? No. But it sure is a place where God uses you and God grows you and God blesses you. And you need to be a part of it. It was there on the mountain of the Lord. It shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. By the way, if you ever wonder what that means, it means that God makes a covenant. He is a covenant-keeping God. And rather than making a covenant with you and me, because guess what you and I will do? We will fail. Sometimes we'll be late on the payment. Sometimes we will break the agreement. So God said, I'm not going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a covenant with myself. When it comes to his grace and his mercy and his love and his salvation, he didn't give a promise just to you. He didn't say it's up to you and me. He said, no, no, it is up to me, and I am going to give salvation to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. That's the covenant. He said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, and I will surely bless you. How many of you know that when you pass the test, there comes a blessing? Sometimes we fail in the middle of a test. Any of you, when you're in high school or college, maybe you have to take a test, and instead of studying as you should, getting ready for the test, you procrastinated, you delayed. There, have been many, there was many a night that I would lay my head on my homework and ask God through osmosis to let that go into my brain so that I could pass the test. Unfortunately, I don't think it ever worked. But you know what? You and I, when we pass the test, it is through faith. It is through trusting God. That's how you pass the test. God doesn't require you to do the impossible. He requires that you and I trust in him. That's the test. He said, I, because of this, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. And he's talking here about the gospel, Jesus Christ. Through him, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Let me ask you this question. Are you living the kind of life that God blesses. Well, I'm not talking about money, but I'm asking, are you living a life that through your offspring, through your works and the legacy that you leave behind, are you leaving behind a legacy for the gospel? Are you just hoping that your kids will get a good job and avoid going to jail? Seems like we've lowered the bar a lot, haven't we? Like, you know, well, his kid's good. He's never been arrested. <laughs> okay. But the point is this. Abraham left a legacy through his son. And because of that, Abraham didn't know, but he had faith. And in the same way, you and I, we may not know what our kids are going to do. And by the way, there is nothing that can be more frustrating as a parent, to see your kids fail or your kids not do the right thing. But let me just say this to you. Don't ever give up. Don't ever stop praying for them. Don't ever stop loving them. The Apostle Paul talked about this in the New Testament. He said that the love of Christ constrained of him. In other words, it's the love of God, the grace of God that draws people to him. And so don't you ever give up on that. But the truth is, God tested Abraham. Let me give you the four main points, and then very quickly, I'm going to give you the application, okay? The four main points are this. Uh, God always tests our faith to see if it's real. No matter where you are, no matter what you're going to go through, God will test your faith. God tested my faith as a teenager. He tested my faith as a college student. 
He tested my faith as a young man. He tested my faith early in my marriage. He tested my faith with my kids. He tested my faith with this church. He tested my faith after having been married for 37 years. He tested my faith after having been a Christian for over 50 years of my life. Now, what is the point? God's going to test you. And don't think, this is not like graduating from high school. How many of you are glad you don't have to go back and take tests from high school anymore? I am. Whew, I'm so glad. I know we got some math teachers in here. Uh, I took Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Geometry, and started out with Trigonometry. As my senior year, after about a week, I said, nope, not for me. <laughs> and so I took Business Math instead. <laughs> Uh, in business math, they taught you how to balance your checkbook. We don't have to do that anymore, but I learned how to balance my checkbook, and I was much more interested in the money that was going to be in my checkbook and my checking account than I was in learning trigonometry. Now, I'm glad I don't have to pass those tests. I don't have to go back and do that again. But you know what? There still are tests that I'm always going to have to pass. And the Christian life is not just, oh, well, I passed the test, I received Jesus, and there's nothing else to worry about, there's nothing else to do. That could not be further from the truth. That's why we say things like, your next step is your most important step. You got to keep on stepping. You got to keep on going. You got to keep on growing. You got to keep on passing the test. Abraham was 100 years old. You got to love our boy Abraham. I mean, you know, I know God miraculously took a 100-year-old man and let him father a child. And he said that, you know, I can't do this and uh, without the power of God. But, you know, after his wife died, if you read in the book of Genesis, you find out that Abraham married another wife. And her name was Keturah. And at 120 years old, he started fathering more kids. Whew. I don't know what was in the food back then, but give me some of that, all right? But God always tests our faith. This is not for God's sake. It's for your sake. Number two, God always provides. God always provides. He didn't know where it was going to come from, but God provided for himself a sacrifice. And he did that for us through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank God. God provides. He always provides. And then number three, God always blesses our obedience. This is what this text means. God blesses you and me when we obey. God blesses us when we follow what he says in the word of God. He blesses it. And then the fourth thing is this story points to the gospel. And it is in the gospel that we find this to be brought together in its fulfillment, in its reality. That God provides. He provides a way of salvation. Now, with all that said, I want to make an application that might be a little different than you expect. This is an application to our finances because uh, that name that God gave uh, himself, the Lord will provide. On the mountain of the Lord, he will provide. I, I believe that it applies to every part of our life. He provides salvation. He provides peace. He provides the ability for you to be strong, to grow. He provides faith for you. But he also provides for us financially. In other words, he takes care of us. God promises to meet our needs. Now, I can't find in Scripture where he promised to meet our greeds. Anybody with me? Anybody do Black Friday shopping? All right, so... Anybody push somebody down to get to something you wanted, right? Uh, moms are normally the one that do that because it's a toy that their kid wants. And I'm talking about this stuff as if I have been shopping lately. I thank God for Amazon. All right, so I don't have to go and fight the crowds, all right? But here's my point. God is the provider. Let, let me just finish my last 10 minutes here with this application. There are two things that we can see from this passage that applies to how we look at how God provides. Number one, we can say, I own 
what God has given to me. I own it. Now, let me, under, let me help you understand. Uh, this is not to suggest that Marxism is the way you should read about that, okay? The ultimate goal of Marxism and uh, critical theory, which came out of Marxism, you know what the, the bottom line is? They want to destroy the gospel. They want to destroy the gospel of Jesus Christ. So read about it. Read far enough and deep enough to understand, all right? So we're not talking about Marxism where uh, you don't do anything and somebody owes you something, okay? We're not talking about that. But, and we're not talking about that you can't own property, being an owner versus a renter or, or whatever. We're not talking about that. But what we're talking about is what I call a poverty mentality. You say, wait a minute. If I say that I own stuff, does that mean I've got a poverty mentality? Yes, it does. Because if it's what you own and you can produce, there's a limit to it. it there will never be enough. And by the way, have you ever noticed that our greed sometimes takes, takes over? And that, you know, we get something that we always wanted and then we want something else. And I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with having a nice car and nice clothes and a nice house or a beach house or a boat or whatever you want, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. that there, I've heard people say, oh, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. No, it does not. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. If you're not satisfied, if you have no contentment, if you're not thankful, you will have a poverty mentality. You say, what does that mean? Well, this mentality is characterized, number one, by lack of faith. Because there will never be enough. Did you notice what Abraham said? He said, the boy and I are going to go and we're going to come back. You see, he realized that through faith, God would provide. That is the opposite of a poverty mentality. Poverty mentality says there will never be enough. I don't have enough faith. Um, this mentality fails to see money the way God sees it. I've heard people say, well, money can be evil. No, actually money is an inanimate object. It is simply a tool. Uh, how money gets used for evil is by the hand that it is in, okay? It can either be used for good or it can be used for evil, okay? Money is simply a tool. is all it is. Uh, money can be a blessing. I thought I'd get an amen right there. Money can be a blessing. Amen. How many of you, let, let me just, how many of you have a place to live? Raise your hand, okay? How many of you have a vehicle to drive? I didn't ask if it was, you know, a Bentley, okay. Uh, but, you know, if you've got a, I've got a car that God blessed me with, and I won't bore you with the details of the story, but I have driven that. I'm in my 16th year of driving that car. God provided. You know what I figured out? Because I had a car payment when I first got it, and my car payment, since that time, if I'd kept the car payment, you know how much money I've saved since I paid the car off, almost $100,000. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying God will provide. God will provide. Money is a tool. Uh, God uses it to be a blessing. But a poverty mentality puts more emphasis, more importance on money than God intended. Somehow or another, as if money is what brings happiness now, don't get that twisted, okay, because you hear a preacher say that. Uh, poverty doesn't bring happiness either, okay? I've never, seen, um, I've never seen poverty be a blessing to people, all right? So what does uh, this poverty mentality do? It's an ownership mentality. I own it. It's mine. What does it do? Well, it tempts us not to earn money honestly, uh, but it makes us feel entitled and leads to complaining and discontentment. You want to find a person that is complaining about how hard it is to live today? Well, why don't you go back to the 1400s and see how they had it? All right? Kings in the 1400s could not dream 
of the stuff that you have today. And, and they would, you would be considered incredibly wealthy four or 500 years ago. Okay? So I want you to understand that we should not be entitled. Nobody owes you anything. Uh, but you need to learn to work. I, I was talking to my parents about this. And I'm not suggesting it's not difficult. But guess what? It's always been difficult. You know what my parents did when I, when I was first born? Now, they were 18 years old when they got married. They were 19 when I was born. And the first house they lived in was my great, great grandpa's. And that house was built out of wood from a church that was so old it was being torn down. This is in the late 1800s, okay? So the wood from this church probably came from the 1700s. In this house, there was no electricity. There was no indoor plumbing. There was no indoor heat. Um, they had to use an outhouse. They had to wind water out of water. This I'm talking about in 1964, okay? I would realize for some of you that's like ancient history, okay? But that's, I'm only 59 years old, okay? And I'm talking about this was my parents. And, and it, they lived there for a while until they could afford to get something better. What is the point? Nobody owes you anything. Life is hard. Yes, we agree with that. But work a poverty mentality says somebody owes me something. It leads to complaining and discontentment. It tempts us not to give generously and causes us to miss the blessings that God promises to us when we give. Well, I can't afford to give. You might need to turn that statement around. You know what I've learned? I can't afford not to give. Let me say that again. I can't afford not to give. And let me tell you, the truth of the matter is, God will bless you when you do. And if you think, well, man, if I won that lottery, people tell me if they won the lottery that they were going to pay for all kinds of stuff for us as a church. And I'm like, what? Well, you don't even give off the money you make now. Why would you think you would give if you won the lottery? Truth is, you take the same mentality, no matter whether you have a little or a lot. Okay? So this is the poverty mentality. It causes us not to heed the warnings about greed and selfishness. Here's what the Bible says about it. It could destroy you. That's a poverty mentality. It could destroy what God wants to be a blessing in your life. Or you can have what I call the prosperity mentality. That is that God owns everything and I'm just his steward. It's one of two choices. I own it all. It's all mine. And you have limited resources and you're going to live in a poverty mentality because there will never be enough. Or you can say, I am just simply a steward of what God owns. And if you do that, he has unlimited resources. He doesn't ever run out. He ain't never broke. Okay? And I'm just simply a steward to manage what God has given me. So what does that stewardship mentality do for us? I'm a steward what God's on. You see, it is God's money, not, not yours. It frees me from stress and worry because it helps me see God as the owner and provider. You want to have some stress reduction over your finances? See, God is the one who owns it all. And he just got you as his manager. Doesn't mean you don't work, doesn't mean you don't plan, but what it means is that you see him as the owner, as the provider. It helps me overcome a poverty mentality and know that there will always be enough. God always is going to bless. It helps me to utilize money and possessions effectively. You see, when I see God as the owner and me as the manager, you know what I've learned? If I'm managing somebody else's money, I'm going to really take care to make sure that it's done right. You know what you get when you have a stewardship mentality? Well, you're not afraid of budgets. You want to try to avoid debt, bad debt. I'm not saying all debt is wrong, but you're not going to max out every credit card you've got and then use a credit card to pay off another credit card, all right? And maybe we've all been there. 
Uh, but you learn about debt and saving and hard work and money management. It's one of the greatest things that will happen to you with your finances if you follow God's plan for you to be a steward. You're, you're not just an owner. You're a manager. You are God's steward. Then it helps me to enjoy it thankfully and without guilt. There was a time in my life that I used to make excuses for the blessings of God. There are some things that God has blessed Kim and me with financially that are just above my pay grade, okay? I've got stuff that people have given to me that are just, I'm like, oh my, I can't believe I had somebody give me, uh, give us two Rolex watches. I'm talking about watches that are worth about 20 grand, okay? Now, don't worry, I pawned them. All right, so no, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Now, what am I saying? I wouldn't have ever bought that. No, I'm just, you know, maybe I shouldn't have used that illustration. But I want you to see that when you live God's way, you can enjoy the blessings of God, thankfully. I used to always make it, somebody see the Rolex watch, and they'd be like, oh, must be nice. <laughs> and I would always make up some excuse and, like, feel bad about it. But you know what? God really convicted me about that. He's like, I'm the one that gave you that. I'm the one that blessed you with that. There's, oh, it's okay for you to give me glory and be thankful for it. So you know what I do? If you see me driving something that you like or living in something that you like or maybe having a watch that you like and you think, oh, my, we must be paying this guy too much. You know what you say? Oh, that sure is nice. You know what I've learned to say? Sure is. Thank God for it. Now, what is my point? A steward enjoys what God has given to him thankfully and without guilt. You don't need to make an excuse. Now, don't try to be a $40,000 a year millionaire. You say, what do you mean by that? You make $40,000 a year and you want people to think you're a millionaire and you, what you drive and where you live and all this stuff. If you got sick and got a cold, you would miss three hours of work and you'd go bankrupt. <laughs> Don't live that way, okay? But live as the, uh, uh, the recipient of the blessings of God. And then it kills pride and greed. When I see God as the owner, I'm not greedy. I'm not filled with pride. I don't think I'm better than somebody because God's blessed me materially, okay? Because it's not mine. It's God's. And then it helps me to multiply it faithfully. This is something that some people never seem to understand. Kim and I was thinking about this. Kim and I have had a side hustle of some kind for 37 years of marriage. I haven't always just drawn a paycheck from a church or a ministry or whatever. I've done all kinds of things throughout our entire marriage. I did it before we got married. You say, why? Because I know that I'm just a steward. It's not mine. And what God has allowed me to do is to multiply his stuff faithfully. As a result of that, I want you to get this, okay? I'm not talking about our tithe. The tithe is not a gift. The tithe is what I owe to God. You bring the tithe. That's the first 10%. But what God has allowed us to give above the tithe in 37 years of marriage, we could have bought two houses with. You say, oh my goodness, are you, do you wish that uh, you had not given that? Not for a second. You know why? Because I believe the Bible teaches that that's the only thing I can do. Okay? You can't take it with you. I've done a lot of funerals. Never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. Okay? And even if you did, like the old pharaohs, they had all their wealth and their jewels and their uh, riches buried with them. Guess what? It's still there. You know why? Because you can't take it with you. But you know what you can do? You can send it ahead. Read what Jesus said. That's the truth. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It's the only thing that I get to keep. 
It's the only thing that I get to keep for eternity is what I give to God. Well, and having this mentality causes me to give it generously. Generously. So what am I saying? I'm saying that when you trust God and you have a stewardship mentality that God owns it, not you, that it breaks the poverty mentality and gives you a prosperity mentality. Now I'm going to end with the words of Jesus. Talking about money, making the application about money. Here's what Jesus said. And he asked this question. It's a great question. Maybe one of the greatest questions you can ask yourself in this life. And here's what he said. Here's what he asked. He said, what would it profit you if you gained the whole world? He's talking about money. And you lost your own soul. Now, I do believe that the application there is to salvation. You can be the wealthiest man in the world if you don't know Jesus. It's a total waste. It's a shame. It's a loss. But I also believe that it can be applied to us as Christians. You say, what do you mean by that? I've seen so many Christians lose their way. When I say they lost their soul, I don't mean that they're going to hell. I don't mean that they're not still a Christian. But have you ever met someone that was on fire for Jesus and something distracted them and then you meet them later and they've lost their soul? They've lost the blessing? Don't lose your soul. Not over something as silly as money, but rather trust in God. Why? It's his not yours. If you think you own it, you're wrong. Once again, I speak not only from the authority of the Word of God, but the authority of my experience. Because, you know, it was said, and, and I like reading these lists of the world's richest billionaires. You ever do that? Uh, I think it's intriguing. And most of them are about a thousand years old, all right? Some of them are young. But uh, it's just very intriguing to me. But I've read that in history that some of the richest people in the world were astronom astronomically richer than the richest people in the world. Now, I just read this week that the richest man in the world is worth over $200 billion. But you know that they said that Henry Ford, back in his day, if you put his wealth in today's economy, that he was worth, you ready, $400 billion. That's more than the GDP of many countries. That's almost a half trillion dollars. Okay? But what would it profit you if you were a half a trillionaire? If you were the richest person in the world and you lost your soul? Wouldn't matter, would it? Because guess what? This is what I know throughout history. The wealthiest people in the world and the poorest people in the world, every single one, when they died, they left it all behind. They didn't even take a penny of it. And so God challenges us that the way to live, the way to be able to put it ahead and uh, re restore it for yourself, treasures in heaven, is not to be an owner but rather to be a steward and say, it's not mine, it's his. And by the way, he ain't ever going broke. When we get to heaven, he's so rich. Not only does he own everything in the world and all the stars and the planets and the universe and everything in it, in heaven, in the book of Revelation, it describes heaven as having streets paved with gold. Now, I had an intriguing thought. We love gold because of its wealth and what it represents. And God just kind of prompted my thought one day. He said, why are you so enthralled with pavement? You can have all the gold in the world. And guess what? In heaven, you know what it's worth? Just pavement. That's all it is. And so... The question that Jesus asks us is, what would it profit you 
if you gained the whole world and lost your soul? Well, I want to pray. I wonder today if there's somebody here that needs to have prayer for your finances. Maybe it's your attitude. Maybe you have a poverty mentality and you need God to break that in you. Or maybe you're in debt or you have financial needs or you're looking for a place to live or whatever, okay? Maybe you have financial needs. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to commit it to Jesus today. He promised that he is the Lord who provides. And and maybe uh, we need to pray about the miracle offering today. I'm going to explain it all next week. What they did when they dedicated the temple is they worshiped with all their heart. They prayed a prayer of dedication and they gave a great offering to God. And God blessed it. Oh, he blessed it. And that's what we're going to do next week. Maybe you need to pray about that. Or maybe today, you're in the room or online, and you need to be saved. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's the one that gives the faith. When we recognize that we cannot do it on our own, that we are sinners, that we need forgiveness, that we need a Savior, and we call out on him, God says, I will hear that prayer every time. Every time to those that call on him sincerely. So today, call on Jesus. If you're in the room and you need to do that, fill out your next step card, drop it in the drop box. We've got it in the lobby on the way out. Just drop it in that box. Online, just check at the bottom of the screen and let us know that you pray to receive Christ today. But today, maybe you need prayer. Our prayer team and our prayer table is right over here. And you can make your way. We'll have a prayer team that will pray over you no matter what it is. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's a problem you're having. Maybe it's somebody you're praying to come to church. Could be anything. You come and pray. They'll pray with you. They'll wrap their arms around you and be a blessing to you. So uh, you come and pray at the end of the service if you'd like. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you are the Lord who provides. You are the one that provides for us. At the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And help us to believe that today. In Jesus' name I pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen.